Welcome. Today on The Nature Nurse, we have a very special guest, Elliot Weston, who is a megalodon tooth shark expert. And we're excited because we're going to talk about megalodon sharks today and shark teeth. And we are going to answer the question that I know many people have is, are megalodons really extinct or are they still in the ocean? But before we do that and show you his amazing collection, which you can um, purchase one, we'll talk about that at the end. Um, we are going to answer some other important questions about megalodon sharks and the ocean and we are really excited to have you here today, well, thank Elliot. You. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. I'm gonna let... So Elliot is a marine biologist and an ocean entrepreneur on many levels and tell us about that. Well, I first got my love for the ocean as a little boy. Just fishing with my dad in the ocean. Uh, grew up in Chicago, Illinois, so you know, landlocked. Okay. And uh, it wasn't anything more exciting to me than going on a boat in the middle of the ocean, dropping a line in and pulling up different species, all different colors, shapes, sizes. This really interested me. That was one of the main reasons I went to Humboldt State University, became a fisheries biologist. Uh, that's where I got my undergrad, and that's where I started my dive career as well doing scientific and leadership diving. Then came over to the East Coast where I worked for NOAA for four years. And what we did at NOAA was a lot of marsh restoration, um, ocean monitoring, fish surveys. <clears throat> I then went to UNCW where I got my master's degree looking at marsh restoration and using key indicator species to assess overall habitat quality. During that time, I had to create some supplemental income because as a master's student, it, you know, finances are tight. And I'd been diving out in North Carolina since 2009 as a dive master on the Hawks Bill out of Carolina Beach and had quite the collection. So I um, started selling some teeth, did a pilot study to see if it would you know, be able to pay the bills and uh, ended up getting a business loan and then creating a mixed model business that focused on not only the fossils but also utilizing some of the fisheries resources that we have offshore and also leading groups of people out to have a more of a one-on-one -on -one experience with a marine biologist on the Atlantic Ocean. That's awesome. Well, you know, you, it's interesting. You bring up a couple of interesting points. One is that you were hooked as a child to nature and with your dad and the fishing and it's so important um this is what we try to stress at the nature nurse is getting kids outdoors in any way because once you fall in love with nature as a child it just continues for life um so how great that your dad gave you that exposure yeah it really was and you know a story that i like to tell people is that he, I mean, he was always taking us out to find fossils as well which at times you know I come from a family with a lot of kids, so oh. some of us didn't really love it. So it made it tough <laughs> on him, but he still would encourage us to go out and we would find dinosaur fossils in Arizona and go to the petrified forest. And he had his own fossil shark tooth collection and uh, it started at a fossil shop. Actually, he bought his first one in Arizona, Sedona, Arizona, and huh. they're walking around this fossil shops and he had already had, you know, other dinosaur fossils, but I saw this shark tooth and I was just fascinated by it. And as a little kid, it was huge. It was probably a four-incher. And I asked my dad, I'm like, Dad, can you buy me this shark tooth? And he looks at it, and he turns it over, and he looks at the price tag. He's like, no, I can't buy you this shark tooth because, I mean, I'm a little boy. I'm probably going to break it. And it, it was probably $300. Uh -huh. But what he ended up doing was buying it for himself, and he oh, let wow. me hold it every once in a while. And so we'd sit down on the carpet, and we'd talk about it, and let me hold it. And so when I found out that there were megalodon teeth out here, <laughs> I started diving for them, obviously, and I was pretty excited about it. And the first really big six-incher I found, I gave to him for Christmas. Oh. And I told him, I was like, see, I don't need you to buy me shark teeth. I'll find them myself. <laughs> and it's way bigger than yours. And he puts it right next to his little baby one, and it's this massive one. Oh, that's so, a yeah, story. I mean, it just kind of came full circle. And, uh, yeah, just, you know, really it's, it's something that I enjoy doing. I really enjoy to encourage kids to get out there 
get involved in natural sciences, learn about, you know, the creatures of the past so we can understand the ones of the present. Mm -hmm. My son and I, we do a lot of fossil hunting together. I created the fossil dig kits uh, for children. Okay. And it's a hands-on learning type of kit where they can dig up different species. They can feel that excitement of finding their first shark teeth, oh, cool. even if they live in Chicago, Illinois. Oh. Right, Scott? Um, you know, quarry material in it. We, we hand plant all the, you know, smaller species, and then everyone has at least a fragment of a megalodon in there so every kid will find a megalodon oh, okay. even though the label says one in five they all have at least one <laughs> megalodon and one in ten do have a full so oh wow one in ten will get a nice now is that megalodon. on your website yeah okay yeah. so we'll, a, we'll give you information about elliot's website so if you're interested in getting one of these fossil dig kits um it'll be there what a great gift for a kid's party or yeah. whatever that's awesome so you're talking about diving so tell us about diving and how you get them because the the exciting thing um unlike you coming from new york i never heard of megalodon and when i got down here in north carolina and i think i actually saw it posted in the paper uh, there was a uh, story about someone who actually found one on the on the beach which yeah. happens occasionally here it's like winning the lottery but yeah, it ends up in right. all the news and it's how exciting that would be but i was intrigued i'm like wow that that I think is like you, I just found them fascinating. Yeah. And, um, but you actually go out in the waters off here. We're in Wilmington, North Carolina. So he goes off the shore and we do have to give you a big caution here. This is not for the recreational diver like me. This is, tell us more about what the serious nature of, uh, and the complexity of diving for, for Megalodon teeth and what that requires. Well, I would say that diving for the megalodon teeth is probably one of the most uh, dangerous diving in the world. It's far offshore, you know, anywhere for t from two to three plus hours to get to your sites. There's a couple closer sites, um, but the, you know the ones that are hit most often are pretty far offshore. The conditions can change pretty quick. It's deep. The visibility can be low at times, and the currents can switch around as well. And when people start finding things like shark teeth, they get what I call shark tooth fever. They stop thinking about all their skills and run into problems. I mean, it's really meant for people who are treating diving as a, as a physical activity. You know, I mean, like in college, there's a PE class. You want to train to be really good. It's not like the Bahamas where you jump in, there's no current and the visibility is 100 mm -hmm. foot. It's very strenuous, so you have to incorporate that into your dive profile, and you need a lot of gear. Um, a lot of times we are tithing with an anchor, so you need to be able to go from that anchor line out to find shark teeth, back to the anchor line and up. So your navigation has to be what has to be good, you to, or you have to be able to use a rec reel, and um, things always go wrong. So you want to make sure you have redundancy, dive with a buddy. When people are finding shark teeth, usually the visibility gets poorer because, you know, they're picking them up, picking them up off of the surface, but they're also fanning below the tooth to what is called moro. It's this ancient clay where the teeth can lay right on top of. And so a little silt will go into the air when people are kicking around. Mm -hmm. So your visibility will get worse. And if you're not used to that, you can get disoriented and... Some right. people panic, which is the last thing you want to do. Right, because there was actually a diver this spring that died. Well, I there's heard. been two so far. We oh. lose a couple of divers every year, unfortunately. It's just, yeah. it's, it's dangerous, and it's you exert yourself a lot. Yeah, so depth. if this is something that you're thinking you're going to try, we really caution you. If you don't have all those skills that Elliot's talking about, this, this is something that you work yourself up to, but it's not something to just dive into right away yeah i definitely so, want to go a, a slow progress uh, yeah. yeah progression but um yeah and most of our sites are roughly 80 foot to 120 feet so mm -hmm. it's considered deep dive so it must be it, mu it really must be quite the thrill when you do find one oh or yeah like a batch of them or oh know. yeah i mean yeah do you still get that thrill when you see them i do <laughs> I, you know now I, I look for the really special ones that's what gives me the thrill because okay. when you find a lot of them it's I think it's like anything else, you know. So tell us, like, how many teeth did a megalodon shark typically have? They had 
hundreds of tees because they had multiple rows. I believe three rows on each, you know, lower and upper that were exposed. But underneath, it's like a conveyor belt of teeth that just oh, come out. Okay. Um, and they would lose you know, hundreds, thousands. I'm not really sure the exact number, to be honest, every year. And we're talking about millions of sharks. Uh-huh. So every millions. I mean, every time they're feeding, they're losing teeth. Yeah, they were the, you know, largest shark so, that ever lived that would feed on whales. So. And how, how big were these megalodon sharks? They're estimated to be you know, over 60 feet. 60 feet. Yeah. So they say, on average, for the megalodon, every inch of shark tooth equals roughly 10 feet of shark. And that's just an estimate. So to wow. give people an idea... But, you know, a, a really big six-inch tooth came out of a shark that was around the size of a school bus. So imagine seeing a school bus-sized shark swimming in the ocean. And not just one, but you're talking about they were quite a bit. Yeah, so if you, you think about it, you know, how big is the animal going to be that has a, <laughs> a tooth this big, right? Like, my teeth are pretty small. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, that's, that's a big mouth to walk through. <laughs> and we're talking about 52 of them. You know, in three wow. rows, top and bottom. I mean, it's that's a that's going to be impressive. Big, you and I could hold hands and walk through the door, pretty much. Wow! In the shark this big. Wow! Yeah. Wow! Mind-boggling. So then the question comes: Are they really extinct? Well, I don't know. <laughs> there have been species that have have been thought to be extinct that have been found. Um, I call them living fossils, right? Okay. Where you can see them in the fossil record, and people think they're gone, but have been discovered later. But they're not as big as the megalodon. The megalodon was a very large animal. So when you do look at the layers in geological time, you can see where megalodon was, and then where megalodon stopped being around. So I would say that it is most likely that they are it's extinct. You know, mm -hmm. is it possible that one's still around or a couple, you know, I mean, because they got to reproduce. I mean, maybe, but it's not probable. So, I would say that they're, they're extinct. And I think the intriguing thing about the ocean is that it's, you know, the ocean is so humbling, is it's so vast and still so unknown to us in many ways that I think that's why people do question are you sure there's not one in there? And I know some scientists actually get angry. They're like, enough of talk about this. They're extinct. They're done. Yeah. But like what you're saying, I think, brings a really good point, is that the, the teeth that he's finding are so deep in the layer um, of our Earth that, and how many millions of years are we talking? Roughly 4 to 20 million years old. 4 to 20 million years. So that's a good time lapse between when the, the, where the teeth are embedded versus where we are today and the chances that nobody's spotted one since yeah. in that time period. So that's pretty good. Um, I can understand why the scientists feel that that's pretty good evidence that they are indeed extinct. And we'd also see some top-down <clears throat> effects if they were still around because mm -hmm. they would see on <coughs> whales, right? So we would see more things happening with, with whales. With whales. Interesting. So did the megalodon have a predator? Megalodon. Just each other? Yeah. Interesting. I would think so, at least. I mean, it's not really proven, but with a shark that big, its caloric intake needs to be pretty high to be able to sustain its its daily activities. Right. So if they can't find food sources, they're going to be an opportunistic predator that relies on whatever's around them. So if they, you know, when they're eating whales and following their they're uh, following them to nursery habitats and the, the times when they would, would have their calves. If they got there and the whales weren't there, but there was other sharks there and they were hungry enough, they would probably most likely turn on the smaller ones. So it's they really are like the dinosaurs of the sea. Yeah. Well, and you know, sharks are modern day. They were around with the dinosaurs and they're still here today. Uh-huh. Yeah. Interesting. The smaller versions. But it, and it's very symbolic for our times also, because here we have the biggest species and so strong, and yet they went extinct. 
and you know it kind of reflects on what we're going through today as we think we're the you know top top dogs on the planet and yet you know our numbers are increasing by the billions um and you know what does that mean in terms of you know there's issues about our food source and concerns going forward yeah. so um it's funny that history story just keeps going and uh what what issues do sharks face, uh, face today, the modern day shark? Well, a lot of it is going to have to do with habitat and the protection of the resources they need to be able to survive. Also, you know, not being overfished. Um, you know, it, it's pretty simple. They got to be able to eat. They need habitat to be able to reproduce, and they have to have. Um, the population has to be large enough for them to reproduce, right? So we just have to make sure that we are moder monitoring their population, making sure that their food sources are plentiful enough to, that they can continue to grow and that our oceans are, are healthy, keeping their habitats good. Mm -hmm. And what about finning? Because I know that. That's... Yeah, I mean, it's uh, a bad practice for sure. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, a big part of overfishing them is that's one of the reasons okay. is because of what that generates revenue wise for those businesses but um i mean it it's tough because there's some people we can't we don't have control over the mm -hmm. the people who are thinning right. we try to regulate them but in the end it's it's a it's it's pretty tough it's um, a different uh, cultural yeah, and practice I, yeah and i don't do a lot with regulations it's mm -hmm. it's a little bit out of my realm on how we can you know, fix that issue. But I mean, we try to educate everybody, mm -hmm. but that's just, you know, if they're not willing to accept it and, and learn that we need the way that we're going to be able to sustain catching animals, catching sharks, catching fish is by also protecting them and limiting how many we take. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the exciting things about UNCW, the University of North Carolina here in Wilmington as well as other um, universities here and along the coast is their um, aquaculture programs where they're creating fish farming yeah. and you know and, the, and there may be some people that have talk about the controversies with that but the philosophy is that because we have so many people to feed we if we can grow the fish and protect the natural fish and let them rebound then hopefully at some point we the tide will turn no pun intended but in the interim we really are kind of uh forced into into some difficult choices right now um but it's it's you know turning out to be a, a great way to create fish and so many people rely on fish for their diet yeah so um so tell us more about um the the teeth themselves. You had one here, oh, yeah. and so why don't you show us uh, a little bit, tell us more about that, and then we're <laughs> going to take a break and we're going to actually go and see Elliot's awesome collection. Um, I do want to just suggest one point because we were talking about them as gifts, and we'll show you some different ideas of art that they use. Um, they, you know, as I talk about often in the Nature Nurse, especially around holiday time, is that you giving gifts from nature or made from nature um, not only helps our environment from adding more plastic and, and junk to our environment, but it's just such a, I mean, imagine what a unique gift that is for Father's Day or as a teacher gift that they could use to teach. And, and you actually go out and educate yeah, kids we, and things yeah. like that. So. Um, if you want Elliot to come to your place or probably you can even do a Skype session or all different ways to reach out to people. Um, he is available and he has so much to share. So keep that in mind. But tell us about the tooth itself. So this is actually the largest tooth I ever found. It's 6.78. As you can see, it's pretty much the size of my hand. I'm six foot three, so wow. In most people's hands it would it'd be very large uh, this is actually the front of the tooth most people think it's the back because this side's so pretty and they always display it this side <laughs> yeah. but this is actually the back so the shark's tooth would look like this coming out of its mouth <clears throat> this um, some characteristics 
of a megalodon to help you identify it. They're going to have serrations, opportunistic predator. So with the serrations, that enables them to select a lot more prey items um, than the piscivorous sharks that really just have, you know, a straight edge like the mako. Uh, this allows them to cut through bone, shells, and um, other materials. You have the serrations. You have the enamel, which is, you know, obviously on the front and the back. You have this section in between the enamel and the root that's called the burlet, as you can see right here. And then when you measure a tooth, you're going to go from the longest point of the root lobe all the way to the tip. So that's where it's going to be 6.78 inches. And then, we you know, once again, as I said earlier, they say that roughly um, one inch of shark tooth equals 10 feet of shark for the megalodon teeth. So this would have came out of roughly a 67 foot shark. Wow. So wow, it's very, just, very large. It's, it's hard to wrap my mind around all that because <clears throat> I, I actually saw a shark a big shark on Carolina Beach once. Uh -huh. I was with a friend and um, we were sitting on the beach. It was in the fall and the water stays warm down here, which is lovely. Mm -hmm. And there was a couple sitting in front of us and the wife got up to go in the water and there were a couple people bobbing around in the water. And just as she was ready to dive into the wave, I swear to you, there was a huge shark. It was at least 12 feet long. In, in the crest of the wave, you could see it. And she saw it just before she dove in and she turned around and she ran as fast as she could out of the water and she looked at her husband and without making any sound, she just looked at him and went. And my friend and I looked at each other, we go, did you see that? And we just started cracking up laughing because her reaction was so funny. And we looked back and we watched the shark swim around the people that were in the water who had no clue that the shark was there, thank God, because they probably yeah. would have freaked out. But it, it just swam along like it was just cruising along, you know, having a good day. And it made me stop and think, wow, imagine how many sharks have passed by and I've never even known. I mean, I swim with sharks all the time and they're not mindless killers that we have to be terrified of. I mean, we have to respect them as predators, but, you know, having these, these fears that can move jaws kind of create and at least for me I <laughs> absolutely I, I think that's the worst thing uh, that someone ever did my a friend's mother took us Paw Patrol. <laughs> and um when i think i was like 12 when that movie came out and that really was a game changer i remember as a kid going water skiing in the long island sound and being that far away when the to get the rope long and i would just i was just terrified i couldn't even get up i, I just wanted to get it back on the boat i was from chicago so <laughs> we'd go into lake michigan when there's no sharks and i'd still think a shark was going to come get me yeah and even before i even as i got older before i started diving and really being able to interact with them i was terrified i was uh -huh. I, actually one of my friends uh kyle de julio in california kept on harassing me to do the dive program I was like, no, we're in the red triangle where there's white sharks everywhere. <laughs> and he convinced me to do it. And, you know, I blame him every day for what I do today. But, um, yeah, it was one of the best things I ever did is, you know, not having that fear of the unknown until I really knew it. Mm -hmm. Started diving with them and been pretty fortunate to have some pretty awesome close encounters with big tiger sharks by myself and oh. some migrating uh, Requiem sharks. Uh, I was in the water with, I mean, probably roughly a thousand sharks moving past me. And it was one of the times in my life I did feel a little afraid because my thought process was, oh, it's only going to take one of these sharks <laughs> to bite me for some reason. And then it, I just envisioned the feeding frenzy. But no, they just all, they just all swam by me and left me alone. And I did abort the dive though because there were a lot of them and they uh -huh. weren't small. Uh huh. So, so there is, and that's, you know, at the end of the day that we talk about often is that nature is such a safe place in so many ways. And that, you know, there's so many fears out there, whether it's sharks or bears or ticks or, you know, and, and those are real things to be aware of and take precautionary measures. But at the end of the day, the uh, most experts believe that the benefits of being out in nature and exploring and doing these kinds of things far outweigh the risks and the risks are minimal, but they are there. So we always do talk about being precautious when uh, cautious when we're going out in nature. It's funny because when you talk about 
diving, I remember my first open water dive, I got down to the bottom and the other girl that was doing her first with the dive master, she was taking longer. She was having trouble equalizing. So I got to the bottom first and I was hanging out on the sand. And when the dive mat, my dive master got down, the first thing he looked at me, he looked at me and he went like this, <laughs> which is the sign for shark. And my eyes were like wide open. And you know, you know, he like was a total prankster, but at the same time, um, because you, you could see he kind of had a smirk yeah. on his face. But then he turned and he pointed underneath this big rock was a nurse shark. That's it, yeah. <laughs> Just hanging out. So, I, you know, I met the shark world right from the get-go. Yeah. And like you say, it was just when you're underneath, explain to people because, like, what captures or what it feels like to be to dive and just exist in that underwater world because it's so unique and i hope more people get out and and try diving because yeah i you know it's hard to really describe but it's almost like you can fly right because you have a buoyancy compensator device that allows you to be neutrally buoyant anywhere in the water column and which is pretty awesome to be able to do that like fish do with their, their uh, gas bladder. And being at depth allows you to have a different relationship or a different experience with these animals because you are now part of their environment. When you're at the top, you're part of a different environment, right? A tiger shark that looks up and sees you flailing at the surface can mistake you for a turtle. At depth, you look a little bit different. Plus, if you're confident, you look them in the eyes, you know, they start to, to see you as something else. Um, and we're large animals. We're not small. And with fins on and all your scuba diving equipment, you look kind of strange. You got <laughs> bubbles coming out. I mean, <laughs> sharks don't really know what to make of you. Mm -hmm. But they, uh, and the only time you really have issues is really when you're spearfishing, is what I found. When I'm doing a lot of spearfishing, there's a lot of fish blood in the water. That really gets them riled up. So that's where you have to be careful. But just... Mm -hmm. Just swimming with sharks in North Carolina, you know, most often they'll just they'll just leave you alone, and you just get to see so many other species and how they interact. Uh, it's like you know a giant aquarium, but they're wild. I mean, it's it's just fascinating. I can't. You have to really experience it for yourself, and everyone's going to have a different feeling when they go under there. But it's where mm -hmm. I really feel at peace because mm -hmm. you really don't hear anything but bubbles and. You know, you just get to observe everything in their natural natural state. Um, you see some really cool predator-prey interactions. I've had some pretty cool close encounters with octopus. Oh. And watching them, you know, feed. And then also with me trying to catch them, them trying to get away. So they've inked me and, you know, can't, tried to pretend like they're a rock. And then when they realize that I know they're not a rock, they're like, oh, God, he knows I'm not a rock. <laughs> <laughs> inks me and tries to run away. It's... It's pretty funny. I uh -huh. mean, animals are, are very interesting and fascinating. And I encourage anybody to, you know, start snorkeling and to, mm -hmm. to get involved with scuba diving because it really can change the way you think about animals and the ocean. Yeah, but respect it. I mean, it is dangerous. You have to respect it. Mm -hmm. But the more you know, the more you can do. Right, right. And, you know, it's interesting when you talk about there. There's there's no word for really – explaining the feeling when you go down there and you become part of this underwater city and you know and that's one of the the challenges that as um, we try to research the healing power of nature is that it, there may not be a descriptor for it it may just be like I think it's Eckhart Tolle talks about your it's an experiential learning it's just something that can't be taught it can't be put into a box and packaged the way we like, you know, our prescription medicine to be, yeah. you know, when you're going out in nature, it's, it's a very, um, organic, objective, subjective, um, experience. And, you know, with the word peace and calm and Zen and all that we hear often well, talking about, especially water or yeah. nature. So I mean, it really gives me life. I feel, I mean, it's why, I chose it as my profession. Yeah, and it. This is a. I'm glad you bring up that point because that's another reason that we talk about getting out in nature, especially the ocean. For, for me, there are days when I don't want to do 
all my chores, the cleaning, the whatever I got to do. But I go to the beach and I come back with so full of life again that I can clean my house in an hour. Like what I, what to, would have taken me two days and, and I would have been miserable doing all of a sudden it just doesn't take that much anymore. So just um, before we go and show you the awesome collection Elliot has and get you inspired even more, um, I just want to talk about why do we need sharks? Because I'm sure there's people out there going, I don't care if they go extinct because then I don't have to worry about them. <laughs> well, they're actually really important for the health of our fisheries. They help balance the lower trophic levels and keep those populations in check. You know, apex predators like that are, are really important for keeping the ecosystem balanced they, they do a good job cleaning up even the dead whales you see the first thing that goes yeah but also you know they'll eat the the piscivorous fish like the tunas amberjack stuff like that if you let those other populations get too large then they'll eat too much of the next trophic level and it will just keep going down so there's no checks and balances mm -hmm. so it's all it's all highly it's all organized it's really all all connected yeah Okay. Well, thank you so much for You're sharing welcome. so far and stay tuned because we're going to go and take a look at some really cool samples and we'll be right back. Come on in. Up next, Elliot shows us some of the amazing, beautiful samples of shark teeth that he's collected over the years. Okay. So getting back to the size of the Megalodon, remember the 6.78 inch tooth when compared to an extinct Mako, you can see what the size would be. That would be a top tooth, the front. Wow. Very large. Probably, you know, the jaw would be as, as wide as this wall. Wow. That's a, that's a big boy. So we're just going to go over a couple of the finds, or the things that you can find off of the coast of North Carolina. And we don't just find shark teeth, even though we do find a lot of those. We also find terrestrial mammal fossils, which is a pretty interesting find when you're 40 miles offshore and 100 feet deep. That's because during the last ice age, the sea level was a lot further out. So terrestrial mammals were, you know, out that far. We find goat teeth. So those are, these here are the terrestrial? Yep, that's a goat. Wow. Terrestrial mammal, yep. Yeah. Find horse teeth. So how do you know they're horse teeth? Well, if I saw that, I wouldn't know what it was. I look, I look them up, oh. and then I ask other people. You know, read the. Uh, there's a lot of good um, fossil guides that you can get books. Interesting. Yeah, from people who've been collecting for a long time. These are actually found off in North Carolina. They're broken, but. Oh. Mastodon. Mastodon. Wow. Yeah, broken mastodon teeth. This actually came from um, one of my friends, Maddie's, Maddie's Megs. That's a gomp tooth. Gomp? Yep. Well, what's a gomp? It was another elephant like huh. animal. I'm actually, I'm not 100% on the gomp. So. <laughs> And then this just goes over the different sizes. Like, yep, so that's that big six incher. And then if you compare it to another six incher, you can see the difference in size. So we have a five incher, four incher, three inch, two inch, one inch. So what creates the different value? It's really going to be based off of quality, color, sometimes sight, if they're really rare to a certain site. And you know, rarity of the, the species. For instance, uh, the Benindinis, uh, different species are, are rare and, you know, highly sought after, and we, don't, we just don't find a lot of them, so they're, they're more expensive. Oh. And then, you know, size as well. So like this one, which is a three inch white shark, is, you know, close to the max size of the teeth that, that are found in, you know, with white sharks. Three inches is a collector's tooth for sure. I've only found one wow. ever. I've been diving since 2009 and this is the first and only three inch white shark I've found. I found a lot of three inch Makos. White sharks are, they're rare they're to get that big. Yeah, also the six inches are, are rare. Um, and the, the better quality ones are rare as well. 
pathologicals are also rare because each one's so unique and they aren't found very often. There's only certain sites that I've found them at. So I guess there was no uh, shark dentist at the time. Nope. This one has a double tip, which is pretty cool. And we found some that have five tips. All sorts of really interesting pathological teeth out there. And if we go over the different species, we can see this one is the auriculatus. This is from Morocco. This is the predecessor to the megalodon. This is actually from North Carolina. This is found in the quarry. I don't have many of the anguistidins, but here's a little one that my son found. And what happens is you start to see these side cusps start to disappear, right? So they went from pretty pronounced to a little bit smaller. And then we have the chubitensis, where you can still see it, right? But it's more of a rounded mm -hmm. cusp. These are found off of North Carolina, chubitensis. And the colors are caused by the sediments they're fossilized in. So the black ones are more of a fat, like a phosphate magnesium sediment, whereas the what I call the Carolina golds are more of an iron calcium rich sediment. So is Carolina the only place you find these gold ones? No, there's other sites that have the gold ones, okay. but they you know they are rare. Um, other colors that are rare are the red ones, real rare. So are there some that you just don't want to part with? <laughs> All of them. <laughs> no, for sure. Um, but, you know, I, in order to run the business, I have to part with a lot of them. Unfortunately, they're all very special, beautiful teeth. If I could keep them all, I would. But then, you know, wouldn't be able to operate and wouldn't be able to share what I find with, with the world. So mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty funny. I've been hunting things for a long time. Minerals. I started off in Northern California finding agates like this, <sighs> semi-precious stones on the beach. And my friends used to always make fun of me because they said, what are you going to do with all those rocks? It's <laughs> like, I don't know. So I started tumbling them and I sold some of them. And I just really liked them. I gave a lot away to family and friends. They're almost like pearl-like. Yeah. They're chalcedony. And so they really look like glass um, all different colors once again it's caused by the minerals that are caused when they are formed uh, we'd also find stuff like petrified wood on the beaches of northern yeah. california which i always thought were really really beautiful. beautiful especially when i tumbled them and i left some in the raw which are also very pretty uh, and a lot of people would go out there and find agates but some people just had more of the passion than others. I'd bring friends out and they'd find a couple, but they really didn't care too much for it. And I was out there religiously. I would, I'd go before first light after big storms with my headlamp because I knew that the first person to walk the beach when there was a big storm is gonna, you're gonna find the big stuff. Mm -hmm. And there was a Native American woman who was also a very avid agate hunter. And we would, you know, sometimes she'd beat me and sometimes I'd beat her and it was always kind of a race. And when we got there, we'd both have our headlamps on and she would go one way and I'd go the other way. <laughs> and this went on for months. We never talked. We'd walk past each other and we wouldn't say anything. And then one day, it was beautiful out, nice and sunny, not really stormy. Um, we walked by each other and uh, I always wore booties, waterproof pants, waterproof jacket because I'd hunt in the surf zone the impact zone where it turned over a lot of the, the agates. And she stopped me and she said, hello. And I said, hello. And she said, all right, see what you got. <laughs> and I said, no, he, he, show me what you got. You asked first. <laughs> she said, okay. So she pulls out her bag and, you know, it was a good haul. You know, a little sandwich bag, about a quarter full. And I pull out mine and I had hit this seam that was just amazing. I pull out two sandwich bags full. And she... And her mouth just opened. She said, oh my. She said, how did you find so many? She, she, she wasn't upset, but she just, she was in awe of how many agates I found. And she told me that I didn't find any of them. So what do you mean I didn't find any of them? She's like, you didn't find any of them. She's like, they're given to you by the creator. That's what she said. She oh. said, that's your gift. Oh. You're given them and it's your job to share them with the world. And I always thought it was a really interesting concept and I've always liked it. Oh. And I kind of carried on 
you know, carried with me when I started finding shark teeth. My first time going to the Meg Ledge, I went with a group of divers. I just moved here. I never found a shark tooth in my life. They'd been out multiple times and you know, we, we jump in the water and I was a spear fisherman, so I was gonna go shoot some grouper. Right? I didn't really I really didn't care about the shark teeth at first. And so I shot some grouper and I get back on board and a couple divers had found some. There's probably five teeth found during that dive and a, one guy had a nice six incher and he let me hold it and I couldn't believe that I didn't try to find the shark teeth. I looked at it and I said, I'm finding shark teeth on the next dive. So we, uh, <laughs> we went to a different site and I talked to the dive master again. And I said, tell me everything I'm supposed to do again, you know, cause he did the briefing and I listened, but I really wanted to make sure that I wasn't following his instructions. And he said, we put the anchor, you know, right at the site, go down the anchor and just start fanning around till you get to the morrow. And once you find teeth, there's more there. So continue to look. And that's what I did. Went down to the anchor. I started fanning, found a tooth and they just kept coming. But I really like that. I, I like that, that concept that she had, that's you know, great. we all have gifts. Yes. What are your gifts? And it's important to learn about what your gifts are and to appreciate them and to use them. I can only imagine your friends when you found all those teeth. <laughs> yeah, in the beginning, because I know when my family and I go hunting just for the little tiny shark teeth on the beach that we find, you know, um, I found a, a great white fossil, small, that, I mean, everyone was like, oh my God, where'd you get that one? So it, it is competitive, but fun competitive. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So tell us where we can find you. So you're on Instagram. Yep. You can find us at Weston Collections on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Uh, my personal bio is Blue Planet 2, a lot of pictures of me with fish and my family. And then we also have a website, it's westoncollections.com. You can also email me at blueplanet2 at hotmail.com or give me a call and you know I will take the time to help you out with whatever you need. And uh, we also do tours of the shop if you and your family ever want to come down and check out some of the fossils in the raw, see the different stuff we do find, a lot of cool whale fossils as well. Just give us a call and schedule an appointment and we'll do a tour. And yeah, you just got to reach out. Awesome. So we'll put links to all this to make it easier for people to find you, but we really appreciate your time today. So thank you so much, Elliot. You're welcome. This thank you. Awesome. Take care. I hope you've enjoyed today's special edition of The Nature Nurse featuring Elliot Weston and his amazing knowledge and shark tooth collection. Um, although they, the science is telling us that there are no megalodon sharks left in the ocean here, we hope that you're still inspired to go out and explore and enjoy the ocean for all the great things that it has to offer. We hope that you will check out Elliot's website at westoncollections.com. Um, just a reminder, I think it's a great gift, his um, tooth digging kit that he offers, as well as the Megalodon shark teeth that make special gifts and, and really great conversation starters. As well as we hope that you like and possibly share, maybe subscribe to our, web, our YouTube channel here because um, we have a lot of great things coming forward. And if you have any comments or questions, please feel free to leave those below. Thanks again for watching the Nature Nurse video today, and we'll see you again soon.